So Tabitha, welcome back to the podcast. You were the number one listened to episode. So thanks for coming back on. Well, thanks for having me. Of course. So let's, we'll dive straight in because I've got so many questions. Let's see how we get on. The first question is, have you ever coached autistic people to full recovery? And how can someone who is diagnosed with autism and OCD before the eating disorder, how can they recover? Is it the same process or do you treat that differently? Not, not as differently as people would expect. So absolutely take that into account. And mostly we're going to take into account what is, I guess, unique to that person as to what may be things that they struggle with if they have sensory issues or other issues. Um, sometimes it's texture stuff with food. Um, to a degree, because also to a degree, we, we just have to be careful that we are doing everything we can to teach the brain out of that fear of weight gain. And that shouldn't take too long. Like if we really do it properly, the brain learns really fast. And so a lot of the time what I say to people is like, I know that this probably isn't fabulous for you, but it, you, it's going to be a short period of time. We're talking four mm -hmm. to six weeks. And then, so even if you're sort of pushing yourself to do things that you really don't like it's sort of erring on the side of caution because it could be that you don't like it due to other factors but it could be that you don't like it due to that fear of weight gain and yeah. so we sort of go at it with a sledgehammer a little bit and so yeah. let's do everything as if it's all about that fear of weight gain just in case it is and then and once we've got past that um first couple of weeks and the brain is starting to learn its way out of that fear of weight gain then we can start being a little bit more like okay that's probably not about that that's probably about other things and you know we don't need to attack that so much and yeah. so it is a little bit different but but not wildly we still have to treat it as my brain is afraid of something it shouldn't be afraid of and I need to teach it out of that which means doing those things yeah and I guess some of the autistic traits my husband's autistic and I work with a lot of people who have autism sometimes it can be a benefit because they're so Definitely. black and white if they've switched that switch to recovery it can serve them in yeah. some ways. absolutely um it it can be a real benefit and it's the same with people that have high levels of OCD that can be a real benefit in recovery and so I always say to people like don't look at your traits necessarily even the ones that drive you crazy don't look at them as negative because any evolved trait will have evolved for a reason, which means yeah. that it must have been helpful to humans, early humans, for some reason or another. And so all traits can be helpful if we point them in the right direction. And with OCD, we just need to give it something to do. And, you know, I, I found it really beneficial in recovery. I sort of made myself OCD about the recovery stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that gave my OCD a job because it just needs a job a lot of the time. And yeah. then maybe super successful in like, I, I got really OCD about not allowing myself to count calories mm. and you know, that, that worked really well for me. I love that. It just needs a job to do. So you get to it give it a, a different job. Mm -hmm. And that can be true of any trait that we would consider to be negative, like any trait like that evolved for a reason. So there has to be policy, positive elements to it. And most of them just need to be given a job. Yeah. Love that. Thank you. That's an awesome answer for that one. Second one, how does one know that one is fully recovered n nutritionally and rewired? I guess that's yeah. kind of obvious, but. Yeah. Um, so with, let's start with the neural rewiring stuff and specifically what we're trying to teach the brain or rewire is the brain's belief that weight gain is a threat. And so that's what we have to teach the brain out of. And if we teach the brain out of that, we should see a cessation or a stopping or a gradual decline of all of the signs and symptoms that tell us that we have fear of weight gain. And so, mm -hmm. for example, one of the um, easiest to see sort of symptoms of fear of weight gain are what I call inappropriate emotional responses. And that's any emotional response that if we look at that situation, we can look at that situation and go, oh, it's inappropriate that my brain had that emotional response at that time. So a good common example I use is that if a friend just sporadically phoned you up mid-afternoon and said, oh, hey, do you want to go out for pizza tonight? 
a lot of people who have eating disorders would immediately feel anxiety at being asked mm -hmm. that question. If we look at that scenario and just say, okay, is it normal for one person when phoned by a good friend and asked <laughs> if they want to go out for pizza? Is, that, is it normal for them to feel anxiety? And for a person with no eating disorder, no, anxiety is abnormal in that context. And so yeah. then we can look at the, the we can look at the generation of that anxiety, the brain's generated anxiety, and we can go, oh, that's super interesting that my brain generated anxiety in a situation where we would have thought anxiety was inappropriate. Now, the yeah. brain thinks it is appropriate, otherwise it wouldn't have done it. Yeah. And so then we can trace that back to if my brain believes that a negative emotion is appropriate, where in most people's brains it wouldn't be, then I can see that's a fear emotion. My brain is afraid. And when we have an eating disorder and we start looking for these inappropriate emotional responses, most commonly anxiety, guilt, shame, disgust, regret, mm. all of those emotional responses are present a lot of the time when we have an eating disorder. They're, they're sort of on, <laughs> they're there all the time with, with a lot of us. They shouldn't be. You know, the brain's generating fear emotions like all the time. And so then we can look at that. And that allows us to sort of see our fear response and see how prevalent it is. Yeah. And as we start doing that rewiring work to teach the brain out of that fear response, what should happen is those inappropriate emotional responses should just go down, 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 down until the day comes when a friend can phone you up and say, hey, do you want to go out for dinner tonight? And it's like crickets, no anxiety there. It's like, oh, and it can be a sort of surprise for some of us. You're like, wow, I didn't even feel any anxiety about that. That yeah. is when we can start to see, okay, well, the brain has stopped generating a fear response. Therefore, it must be working on teaching the brain out of that fear response. Yeah. And so we can use, if we can start to track our inappropriate emotional um, responses, not from like a judgmental point of view, but just as that's our data, you know, we can start to see them and just go, oh, super interesting that my brain made me feel guilty after eating that thing, guilt's a fear response. Uh, and then we can start to see our fear response and then we can start to kind of track it and as it trends downwards we'll be able to see and feel that so that's how we know whether or not we're achieving um rewiring the fear response and by the way that should happen relatively quickly so you should start seeing a reduction in inappropriate emotional responses or at least the severity of them they'll be there but much milder after a week really or even sooner and then as the weeks go by and usually by week five, six, sometimes seven, that's when it's like, oh, it's just kind of not really there anymore. So it doesn't take that long if you're really consistent with the training. Yeah, consistent. If you're back and forth with the training, so you're acting as if you're not afraid of weight gain one minute, but acting as if you are afraid of weight gain the next minute, you will notice that those inappropriate emotional responses don't change because you're being inconsistent with what you're trying to teach your brain so it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and then with nutritional rehabilitation, so if we're doing what we need to do in order to teach the brain out of fear of weight gain, and in order to teach the brain out of fear of weight gain, we have to act as if we're not afraid of weight gain, which means we have to eat without restriction. That means in accordance to mental hunger. It means that we have to eat not to appease our fear response, but to actually provoke our fear response. So we always have to be eating the scary versions of every food and we can't engage in any body weight suppression behavior. So that's what we have to do if we want to teach the brain that we're not afraid of weight gain. Um, if we're doing that and we're doing that consistently, then nutritional rehabilitation just kind of happens as a byproduct of doing the neural rewiring work. Your body will gain weight. Um, usually mental hunger is super high to start with in the first couple of weeks. But if you properly eat without restriction, then that will start to track downwards. And usually for most people, that's again, that's weeks and months, not months and years that it takes for that mental hunger to track downwards and when your mental hunger tracks down and then normalizes and you're kind of left with what would look to be for most human beings a normal appetite normal yeah. intake then that work's done then yeah I experienced that too and I remember when I genuinely could say I am no longer afraid of weight gain I kind of knew that I'd arrived in recovery land because I was not afraid of weight gain anymore and I never felt guilty after eating and that is an incredible place to be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, remember... it's sometimes yeah sometimes we're so used to those inappropriate emotional responses that we just think that's normal or I guess we don't even notice them and then when you start to notice them you're like wow my brain's doing all this crazy stuff all the time but then when you do recovery you really notice their absence when yes. you just eat something and then you're sort of waiting for it to hit yeah. and nothing happens. And then you're just like, oh, wow. Okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I remember in one of your books, it might be your main book, The Rehabilitate, Rewire, Recover. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading something like in society, because society is fucked up and fat is bad and thin is good. Mm -hmm. I remember you using an analogy, something like if you were trying to get over your fear of snakes or spiders and you were getting there, then you went out into society and you went to touch one and everyone was like, no, 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 don't touch that. That just resonated so much with yeah, me because exactly. society it's challenging, but we can do it even in the society that we live in. We can get over yeah. the weight gain. Yeah, and what we have to often do, even when we're just in recovery or, or just, you know, kind of not completely there mentally, not completely rewired that fear of weight gain mentally yet, we have to sort of almost pretend and act confident, like, no, I can't touch this snake. You're all idiots. Even though people's responses have actually triggered a fear response in us. Yeah. We then in that moment have to override that and pretend for our brain's sake more than anything else. Pretend, no, here, brain, I'm still modeling that I'm not afraid, despite the fact that other people around me are afraid, which <laughs> takes it up a notch. You know, it, it takes it up a level to be able to do that in that yeah. situation. But yeah. well, we also get to surround ourselves with friends as we grow mm -hmm. that are more in alignment with where we're at, not that bullshitting around with diets yeah. and yeah. all of that stuff. That's and I think that happens mostly naturally I think yeah. we often surround ourselves with people that sort of align with us and I think that a lot of us find that as we move through recovery we sort of don't like our friends that much when we mm. come out the other side and we just find that we don't actually have that much in common with them after all yeah. and it just fizzles out usually pretty naturally and we then often have a little bit of a lonely spot where mm. we feel that we don't know who our people are mm. and we haven't you know found our new people yet which can be a little bit difficult for some some of us but then I just always tell people just hang in there people will come in and fill that space yes. and they'll be the yeah. right people yeah love that this is quite a long question I wanted to shorten it but I think it does make sense to read it all it's not too mm -hmm. long so advice on how to stop the vicious cycle of guilt and shame from childhood trauma and how my eating disorder feeds, no pun intended, on the guilt and shame when it comes to eating. I feel undeserving of eating and I constantly seek validation, permission, justification to eat, mainly from my husband to ease the shame and guilt. Thank you in advance. Yeah, so it's always a little bit more difficult. You know, eating disorders are not a result of trauma, but they absolutely tie in with trauma and can feed into one another and just it adds a complication mm. um however it's it it's it is just that it is a comp it's just a complication and you sort of have to treat it the same way that you treat everything else about eating disorder recovery and that is well it's inconvenient that my brain does that however my brain does that and I will have to fix it and so those thoughts that she's described of I'm not worthy of this and this that and the other those thoughts have to just be put into the same category of these are disordered thoughts that I have to work in opposition to. And mm -hmm. even if the, if the brain generates that thought, then she has to act in opposition to that thought, even though deep in her core, she believes that thought is true. She yeah. has to act as if it's not true. So don't worry about what the brain's doing or what the brain's saying, or don't worry about the emotions it's generating. Let all that carry on in the background. Just focus on your actions, acting like a person who deserves to eat what she wants and doesn't need to ask permission for any of these things. And it will feel ingenuine, but that's kind of the point. Don't worry about that. We have to model to the brain how we want it to operate. And so you have to model, this is the person that I want to be brain. And this is what I want to believe about myself. And your brain will kick and scream about it and say all these things, and that's not true. But just don't even sort of acknowledge that just model it like you're the most sort of tone deaf person that you know ever lived and you're sort of completely ignoring what's going on in your head and in the surroundings and you're just saying I want to be like this and I'm going to act like this and your brain will fall into line if you're consistent with that yeah and it reminds me of something my now husband said to me, which resonated so much. And I didn't like it because it was true. So when I was having the exercise addiction, which was part of the eating disorder, he said to me, your eating disorder cannot physically make your legs run a 10K, a 10K run every morning. Mm -hmm. The eating disorder is not like, OK, one leg in front of the other. And I was like mm -hmm. so angry because I knew he was right. I mm -hmm. was choosing 
to do that. Yeah, and I think that that's really important. Like I won't tolerate it when people say I had to or I couldn't or yes. it's like, that's not true. Yeah. You did not have to go for a run. You chose to go for a run. Completely different things. And this is, I get a bit of a uh, be in my bonnet with this with therapists because therapists mm-hmm. often use that terminology and um, allow people to believe Stay in their shit, those things. Basically. Yeah, they allow people to believe, oh, you couldn't help this. Mm. You know, like that happened because of this thing that you can't control. And I don't think that's helpful whatsoever. No. You know, we have to be accountable for our actions. And you know, we have to be purging is another one like for people that purge purging is such a strong urge mm-hmm. when it kicks in almost yes. panic level of I have to purge right now but if you can sit through that it does go away it's mm-hmm. like a wave that will come you need to sit through it you need to not take any action not take any purging action and yeah. then it will get better in that height of that panic that's where you have to be able to control your actions and behaviors and you just have to get it into your head it doesn't matter how panicked I feel. It doesn't matter what my brain is saying to me. I will not take that action. And you just have to be so stubborn about that. And you have to understand that if you took that action, no one made you to do it. And your yes. brain didn't make you do it anyway. Your brain strongly suggested and made you feel like you wanted to do it, but you were still responsible for taking the action. And if we can just focus on our actions, we can have control of those. Yes. And like I said, it doesn't matter what the brain's doing. Focus on the actions, get the actions in line and the brain will follow suit. Follow, yeah. We train ourselves via our behaviours and via our actions. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I've said to clients before, depending on how they're motivated through fear or reward, mostly fear, the clients I work with, I say if someone unfortunately had a gun to your head, literally, and they said, if you don't eat unrestrictedly today, I'll pull the trigger, could you do it? the answer is mainly yes Mm because they have to well they've still got a choice still Mm -hmm. but if the answer is yes or the gun's head to a loved one's head or whatever it is if the answer is yes they could then it's not i can't it's i won't it is yeah it's pretty much always i won't or i don't want to and that's like well duh of course you don't want to exactly (laughs) yeah (laughs) okay so tabitha's thoughts regarding recovering and needing to go all in is this the only way to fully rewire the brain? What if someone takes longer to get to the point of being able to go all in? All right. So I think sometimes people don't really understand why I say that you have to change everything at once. Yeah. That's nothing to do with nutritional rehabilitation. It's nothing to do with gaining weight. It's nothing to do with the physical side of things. It's 100% to do with teaching your brain out of fear of weight gain. And if we understand that an eating disorder, that that fear of weight gain is responsible for everything an eating disorder is. It's the fear of weight gain that gives us a desire to suppress our body weight. It's the fear of weight gain that generates all those inappropriate emotional um, reactions of guilt, shame, disgust, regret, anxiety, whenever we try and do something that could lead to weight gain. You know, it's that fear of weight gain that makes us sort of stuck on this tightrope where we're really afraid to change our daily behaviors in any way because we're afraid that if we change anything that we could gain weight. So the fear of weight gain is responsible for everything your eating disorder manifests as. And so in order to get an eating disorder gone, we have to teach the brain that weight gain is not a threat. And only then will the brain stop generating inappropriate emotional responses. And even better, it will stop giving you the desire to suppress your body weight. So then it's not a fight every day, like, oh, I'm trying to make myself eat or I'm trying not to engage in body weight suppression behaviors like over-exercising. You just got no desire to do those things anymore. Yeah. And so that's really what we have to understand is that is the goal to getting the eating disorder gone and gone for good. And if we want to teach our brain not to be afraid of something that our brain is currently afraid of, then in order to do that, we have to act as if we're not afraid of that thing and so if you're afraid of anything whether it's spiders or snakes or getting on a plane if you want to get over that fear you have to do the thing that you're afraid of and that involves acting as if you're not afraid we are afraid if your Mm -hmm. response is going crazy so if you're afraid of flying and you get on a plane you are afraid but you force yourself to act physically as if you're not getting on the plane I'm sitting here I'm breathing yeah right And the brain is watching our actions. The fear response is watching our actions. And if the brain is watching you act as if 
the plane or the spider or the snake is not scary, then the brain starts to go like, oh, well, maybe that thing's not scary after all. Mm. Unfortunately, we have to do this really consistently. It doesn't work to just do one day of acting as if mm. you're not afraid of weight gain. You have to do it for longer than that. But in a great sort of scheme of things, it's not a massively long time. Like I said, we're talking weeks and maybe months rather than months and years. It's relatively short-lived because the brain burns really fast if we mm. consistently we want, we want to train it. But if we are inconsistent with our training or if we are confusing with what we're trying to teach the brain, it won't learn. And yeah. so that's why if you want to teach your brain that weight gain is not a threat to it, you have to consistently act as if weight gain is not a threat to it. And consistently is the really important word there because, sure, you could say, all right, well, I'm going to ease in gently. And at dinner time, I'm going to let myself eat without restriction. But breakfast and lunch and all the rest of the day, I'm restricting. Well, sure, great. You acted as if you weren't afraid of weight gain at dinner time. But the rest of the day, 80% of the day, you were acting as if you were afraid of weight gain. So, how do you expect your brain? To learn not to be afraid mm. of weight gain. You're being inconsistent. We yeah. have to be obsessively consistent. Every decision, I'm making a decision as if a person with no fear of weight gain would make this decision. And if we are that consistent all the time, every like eating without restriction, not engaging in any body weight suppression behaviors, then that really condenses the amount of time this takes because the brain will learn yeah. very fast if we're consistent. And I liken it to cramming for an exam. What we do when we cram for an exam is we build neural pathways because we repeat information obsessively a lot of the time. Yeah. We spend all our waking hours rereading our notes, we're cramming. But that works to pass an exam. And it works because your brain built superficial neural pathways, which allowed you to pass the exam. Mm. And so you've got to think of it in the same way. If you cram for recovery, really go for it, especially in the first five days, just eat everything. Don't do any exercise really really go for it then after five days you'll feel like you're in a different brain already because your brain will have built superficial neural pathways and then once you've built superficial neural pathways all you have to do is keep going and they'll turn into established neural pathways mm. and that doesn't take that long if you're consistent but where people trip up is they're inconsistent um or they're just kind of like okay well i'm going to increase the food great fabulous but I'm going to keep doing exercise. Yeah. So then it's like, okay, well, with your eating, you're acting as if you're not afraid of weight gain. But then five minutes later, you're acting as if you are afraid of weight gain. So what's your brain supposed to think? You know, it's just going to do gonna what it's anything, used to doing, which, which is, is being afraid. stronger. Yeah. yeah. And so I always say to people, if this is not, if this is not working quite quickly, it means you're doing it wrong, bluntly. Yeah. You yeah. know, if you if you've been doing it for five days and you cannot tell any difference in your brain it means you're doing it wrong and you must be doing something that is causing your brain to still believe it needs to be afraid of weight gain i.e somewhere in your day-to-day -day activities you're acting as if you're afraid of weight gain and you've got to find that thing that you're doing and you need to stop doing it mm. and then you yeah. should see the progress yeah because i've had clients recover from severe anorexia within three months not everyone yeah. but yeah. because they have fully committed and i like to say commitment is like being pregnant you either are or you're not yep. no absolutely absolutely committed. and you know I totally get I get the thinking behind easing and gently yeah. I understand but when you understand it from uh, we are teaching the brain out of a fear response perspective you can see why that won't work yeah and in fact it's just a waste of time makes sense yeah and this leads into I think you have kind of answered it I'll ask it anyway it will be interesting to hear how Tabitha managed to go cold turkey on exercise and how she was able to tolerate the uncomfortable feelings. You know, um, yeah. Um, I just, you know, the, hard, the hardest thing about going cold turkey and exercise is getting yourself to the point where you're willing to do it. That took yeah. four years. Yeah. Um, you know, the first kind of like, I don't know, six years of my eating disorder, I was just loving it, having a great time. Well, I wasn't really, but you know what I mean. Yeah. I was like, you didn't want it disorder. gone enough right. to do something. And about then, it. yeah, then there was this four year period where I hated every second of my day. Mm. And I especially hated all the running that I was doing, but I still did it. I would run crying because I hated it so much. I was so bored, mm. but I still did it every day. And my sort of the hoops I had to jump through on a daily basis were just so ridiculous. 
Um, but I still kept doing it for, so there's this four year period where I did not want to do it, but I also didn't want to change. I was too afraid to change, which was torture. Um, and then it really just one day I was just done. I just, I just decided I'm, I'm stopping and I meant it and I stopped and it, it actually was not nearly as difficult as I thought it would be. In fact, it was this huge anti-climax. I just stopped and I thought that all hell would break loose and it just kind of didn't it was just fine and I'll tell you the reason why that was because I'd had attempts before where I'd been like oh I'm gonna cut down on my exercise which didn't work in the mm -hmm. slightest and the difference was was it's using almost that sort of hmm, some people would say it's a slightly autistic trait some people might say it's a slightly OCD trait but whatever way you want to look at it it's like extreme stubbornness that most of us have yeah. And once we decide something is done, our brains can be like a brick wall about it. And you can use that trait to your advantage so much in yeah. recovery. And when I got to the point where I was ready or willing to make myself be done with exercise, I just really was like, it's like in my head, I had slammed that door shut and bolted it. And like, it was like, I am no way, no how going to exercise like it doesn't matter what happens I'm not letting myself do it mm. and it was almost as if my well of course my brain knew that I was serious because my brain is my brain so my brain knew there's no way she's going to exercise mm. so it kind of left me alone whereas if you do it and you're kind of like oh I'm gonna try my best not to exercise yeah, try a, yeah as soon as you say that as soon as you say the word try You've left a crack in the door that says I can do I can go through that door if I want to. Mm. And your brain knows that you've left the door open. And because the door open, your brain is going to keep on at you to go through it until you go through it. But when you slam that door and bolt it, your brain knows that it doesn't matter what it does or what it says, you're not going to exercise. So it actually tends to just leave you alone. Yeah. Because it's like, what's the point? It's not happening. And that is what I found had to happen with me I just had to be like so so dedicated to it's not happening under no circumstances will I let that happen and then when I did that I was like oh it's quite my brain was kind of quiet about it <laughs> whereas before even when I'd been like I'm gonna cut my run down by a mile oh the hell that let loose in my brain or that sort of thought you know yeah and I think it's because of that we get so nervous about even stopping because we think all hell's going to break loose because all hell break does does break loose when we try and cut down because yes. the brain knows it can get away with it. Yeah. But when you're really using that stubbornness trait and the brain knows it can't get away with it and you've made the decision, it tends to be pretty quiet and give you a much easier time. Yeah. If it doesn't, then what we have to do to survive recovery anyway is we do have to work out how to disengage from our emotional response and so if it doesn't you know you have to disengage from the emotional response the emotional tantrum that the brain's generating which is actually easier to do than you would think it was um and then it doesn't matter how much your brain's pitching a fit you're just not engaging with it so it's mm. not emotionally affecting you yeah it's like um when you were a child did you ever want something and your parents just said no because i said so and you just knew no matter how much you begged, screamed, mm -hmm. shouted, pleaded, it was a no. So you just gave up. It's exactly right. It's exactly the <laughs> yeah. same thing. And like our brains do know. Our brains know if we're sort of, you know, if the door's open and the brains know if it's mm. like complete no-go area, you're not going to have any luck with that. And that's really what, what you have to create in your head. A lot of what we have to do in recovery is like we have to parent ourselves. Yeah. We have to be a really strict parent. Yeah. And we can do that because a lot of clients or people say, I don't know how to do that. And it's it's hard to say it's a choice, but it is a choice and you can do it. Anyone can do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just yeah. using, I guess, your willpower in the positive way and yeah. fucking choosing to do it. End yeah. of story. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's a choice. Exactly. It's yeah. also a choice to engage with the negative emotions that your brain's generating that's mm -hmm. a choice too and that's something you have to choose not to do yeah. if you engage with the tantrum that your brain has when you do all the things that it's afraid of then you won't last very long because emotions are really tiring um especially negative ones you know you'll just end up like being a, a wreck rocking in the corner <laughs> of the room crying <laughs> Whereas if too. You, right if you choose to disengage with that emotional response like 
know, your brain can scream blue murder and it's not affecting you because you're not listening to it. Yeah. And, it, you know, that's that's sort of where we have to be with the negative emotions that the brain's generating. We just have to sort of accept that the brain is going to generate them, except that until that fear of weight gain is rewired, there's nothing we can do about that. It's going to kick and scream. But also accept that we do not have to choose to be involved with that brain can do all it's kicking and screaming and you just carry on as if it's not happening that's a choice too yeah. and then the other choice is also we can choose to allow recovery to be lovely yeah. um you know when I went into recovery like I there were no blogs and there was no recovery resources and I didn't talk to anyone about it so I was just you know, kind of clueless and I just followed my nose and uh, and nobody ever told me, you know, like recovery has to be this awful anxiety provoking time. Mm. And I guess what I decided with that stubbornness tray, I decided, look, you're going to gain weight. It's going to happen. So you may as well enjoy it because I could choose to gain weight and engage with all those negative emotions and, you know, have an awful time. But if I was going to get to that end place either way, I was like, oh, I could choose to engage with the part of my brain that is just loving it. Because yeah. for most of us, all of us, I would say, there's this big part of your brain that is exhausted and hungry and wants nothing more in the world but than to rest and eat. Yeah. And there is a big part of your brain that when you start doing recovery, is like, oh, my God. This is so good. Thank God you for can, this. Yeah, you can choose to engage with that part and you can just let it be lovely. And yeah. there's nothing to like about recovery. You get to rest and eat. It's fabulous. And I, so I, I just, re- I enjoyed the food freedom so quickly and then I prepped myself um I I mean we didn't know what our set point weight was going to be until we reach it but I prepped myself I was like right I'm gonna get bigger so I would look at women in an average size that I thought I would end up I actually didn't end up as big as that and I was Mm -hmm. like I'm gonna prep myself to like or accept Mm -hmm. this body Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I didn't end up I know. anyway. I was I was just like, I'm just gonna fucking brainwash myself right now. That's I'm gonna brainwash doing. myself. And yeah. so this is beautiful. Yes. You know. Yeah. It works. Yeah. We get to brainwash mm-hmm. ourselves to serve us instead we of absolutely do. to hinder us. Yes. Love that. yes. I'm I've heard you answer this before, but I think it's really worth asking you this. The fear of developing poor health when eating unrestrictedly. It's very common this question, right? In different ways. Yes. You know, so for anybody that, and all of us, by the way, all of us that sort of are contemplating recovery, get this thought, oh, but it's so bad for me to eat all that sugar and all that fat, right? I might get diabetes. Yeah. That's just an unproductive fear-based thought. That's just your brain doing its job of trying to put you off doing something it's afraid of doing. And so you've got to identify unproductive fear-based thoughts like that and just write them off for a start you know because they're, they're not helpful and it usually doesn't matter how many times somebody assures assures you that it's not going to happen that you'll be fine your brain still is going to keep generating that thought and it doesn't mm. listen so you know it's a bit of a waste of breath anyway however um for that particular one you know i'm not i'm not, uh, eating usually when we eat without restriction i'd say for 99 percent of us that means we're going to eat a ton of sugar, usually to start with. The brain and the body wants sugar because it's smart, because it yes. knows it can use that. And it's going to mean that eating a ton of fat as well, if you're doing it right anyway. And again, that's all good. Um, it's what we need to do at that time. But I'm also, it's also true. It is a truth that if you just spent a lifetime eating nothing but sugar, that would not be the best thing for anybody's body. But the good news is, is that body doesn't want to do that. Mm-mm. Because when we restrict a food, the body wants to overconsume that food, overconsume in inverted commas. And so when we do unrestricted eating, we're like a kid in a candy store for the first four to six weeks, usually. Like it can be longer for some people, but you know, so don't freak out when it's yeah. so long. But you know, we're like a kid in a candy store. And then gradually, if we just allow our body to have and our brain to have access to all of this um high sugar high fat food after a while it will just be like it will just chill out about it and it won't desire it as much and then your consumption of that will gradually come down and so if you think about it in the grand scheme of your lifetime all of the damage and destruction you've done by under consuming for your body that might have lasted years but we're talking about a six to eight week period where you're going wild on all these foods and then what you should achieve at the end sort of down the road 
is a naturally balanced healthy diet because that's actually yeah. what our bodies want when yeah. given free access to food the body wants a balanced diet but if we restrict sugar, it's then going to try and overconsume in sugar. And so that's what you have to sort of understand is it's not, this is not, you won't desire to eat in that way for your lifetime. I know it feels at the beginning, like you can't even imagine yeah. not craving sugar the whole time. It feels over it's all consuming. Mm. But as you go through it, you just start to feel like I'm kind of bored of eating this actually. And you just start to naturally not want that much of it. And so why it goes wrong is where people kind of do unrestricted eating but not completely and yeah. so they allow themselves to consume more sugar but they've still putting the brakes on and then what happens is because you're not completely eating without restriction the body continues to crave sugar and you continue to want to overconsume it for ages and ages and ages and ages and ages and it doesn't come to that point where it gets boring and it kind of gets over it because you've never let it reach that threshold yes. of I can have this whenever I want yes. and that's actually what we really want to avoid because if you do that then we're talking you're a couple of years down the line and you've that still happened to me just FYI I, I did that <laughs> don't yeah, do that it's shit. really really common it's really yeah. really common and if you do it it's not the end of the world either you know you can just reassess rip the brakes off go properly unrestricted eating and then you'll usually see that you you know it'll start to track downwards that's that's sometimes people get all flustered like oh I've really messed it up it's like it's fine you'll be fine just yeah. go stop restricting yeah. <laughs> um, yeah and so I just I think that you know a lot of the people a lot of people really sort of teeter on the edge of unrestricted eating without completely jumping in and yeah. you know you have to understand the reason you give yourself that big push, as scary as it is to properly do unrestricted eating, because for many of us, it can be an unfathomable amount of yes. food. It can be like just shocking how much we can eat. Um, and it can be, you know, super scary for the brain. But, you know, if you're teetering on the edge there, don't dip your toes in, just jump right in because it just it's like you're just going to get to the end goal so much sooner if you just really go for it and not hold back. Yeah, please listen yeah. to that advice because I did what Tabitha said not to do because I didn't have the right coach. I was kind of working my way through. And for months and months, almost a year, I was restricting mentally, thinking I was allowing physically, but I wasn't because I was like, this isn't okay. Yeah. This isn't okay. Um, and it wasn't until I was like, do you know what? Fuck it. This is the way I just eat. And then all of a sudden it just started to dis dis like disassociate, not dissociate, the word I'm looking for, go less, whatever the word is. Dissipate. I'm looking for. Dissipate. dissipate, thank you. Started to dissipate. And then now I generally have a balanced diet without trying. Yes. There's no Absolutely. effort. Yeah, yeah. And most people find, you know, there's usually at some point, there's almost like I found that I was, I was letting myself eat all this, all this. I was really on the sugar and I started recovering. Honestly, I just eat every, everything was sweet. Mm. And then it just started to feel like I'm still eating all this sweet stuff because it was like my brain was like, no, 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 you really still want sweet stuff. And then part of me was like, do I not feel a bit bored of it? Mm. And then, you know, like it was almost like I just got like, I actually don't think I, I feel like I fancy something savory, which was like, whoa, yeah. that's weird. What's going on? You know, <laughs> like, it's like, yeah. this is really odd. Um, and then I'd say for the first couple of years, of my recovery I was nutritionally rehabilitated but I still had a really high sweet tooth compared to most people but then it just continued to come down and down and down and down and now I'd say I go for savory, savory slacks honestly more than sweet stuff which is just unfathomable to me like from knowing myself when I had an eating disorder where I just crave sugar the whole time yeah so trust the process eat unrestrictedly mm -hmm. and it will come and this yeah. next question is linked to this and it's an interesting question actually is it normal to miss extreme hunger after it has passed? Mm, mm, mm. I think so. I think with me, I think I was a little bit like worried. I was like, okay, well, I'm craving less sugar now. So maybe I don't need to eat that much sugar. But then what if I'm regressing if I don't continue eating high amounts of sugar? You know, it's yeah. almost like it worried me a little bit. And yes. then I, so I would carry on just for the sake of bearing with caution. I would carry on stuffing myself with all this sugar. Until one day I was like, I really don't want this. And mm. I started to sort of had to allow myself not to eat as much sugar, but I almost felt like I was 
doing the dirty on my recovery yes. by doing am I restricting oh weird. my god am I restricting right. again yeah right um and I I actually find a lot of people sort of go through that they're worried to mm. to sort of go with eating less of a particular thing when it really feels like it's beginning to get redundant to eat that much of it because they most people when they get to that point in recovery they're so protective of their recovery because mm-hmm. they're like my life is a bazillion times better than it was yes. a month ago so I don't <laughs> Yeah, it's really common. And I just think it's lovely most of the time because I'm like, that's just wonderful that you're that worried about going backwards that, you know, you're sort of really erring on the side of caution. Yes. A lot of the time then people have to be given permission. No, you're at the stage where you do actually get to choose now. Mm-hmm. You get to make a choice whether you want to eat that thing. You don't just have to force yourself to eat through everything. You get to choose at that stage in recovery, which is great. Yeah. Um, but... I think that missing mental hunger, I don't know. I feel like there can be a load of different sorts of things going on there. And I would guess that maybe part of that is that a lot of us find when we have an eating disorder, it really takes up all of our brain space. And it's this, it takes up so much time, it takes up so much energy. It, it's like everything to us mm. a lot of the time. And then when we go through recovery, we're sort of doing recovery and recovery takes up a lot of time and energy and it's kind of like you but you're still having to do a lot mentally or I'm attacking this and I'm doing that it's still kind of like recovery in the first couple of months or the first stages can be again all encompassing it can Mm. be this sort of big thing you're doing and then when you sort of get to the point where your mental hunger is tracked downwards and you've done that neural rewiring it can suddenly feel like this big empty space yeah because now you're just well you're sort of more like a normal human being without an eating disorder but unlike most normal human beings without an eating disorder you know who you who haven't been preoccupied with an eating disorder for years and years and years and have this life filled with all this different stuff you don't have a life filled with all this different stuff and so a lot of the time you just feel like you're sort of you're in this chasm of Mm -hmm. all right well what now and I would imagine sort of missing elements of the recovery process and things like yeah. that are likely to do with that that space that's left yeah and it's just sort of being patient and allowing your life to start to take place in that mm-hmm. space and when that starts to happen you won't have your brain won't even be paying any attention to the fact that mental hunger is gone or what's well your brain's just preoccupied with all these other things like yeah you know normal person things but yeah. it just takes a little bit of time after that first recovery stage for that to happen and you can just feel like you're left hanging a little bit and don't really know what you're supposed to be thinking about I used to miss the high that the I used to call it binging but it was just extreme hunger I used to miss the high that because you need it so much when you first start eating it's like amazing kind of Mm -hmm. like that relief Mm -hmm. so I did miss the high but freedom is so much better than the high as well yes Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the brain, as you move through recovery, the brain stops giving you the high. So even if you did eat a load of food, it's just not there. It just doesn't feel the same. And so then you're just like, well, it's kind of pointless. (laughs) I got to that stage and I was trying to find the high. Yes. And I was like, food is just not doing it for me anymore. This is actually quite sad. But then again, it was a part of recovery that you just have to mourn. Right. And your brain will latch onto something else that gives you that similar sort of high yeah um it will just be you know socially related or work related or it will be something else something that's mm. let's just say healthier usually yeah. <laughs> but it just sometimes takes a while for like your brain to recalibrate and work out what it cares about yes and then once you've sort of I went through this really crazy stage of really not knowing what I cared about being desperate to sort of work out what I was about and just mm. trying all these different things. It's like I was throwing spaghetti against the wall, hoping mm. something would stick and nothing was. And I was getting frustrated. And it's like, I, I was like a 14 year old who's just trying on all these different identities, yeah. trying to find which one was me. And, yeah. you know, like I'd try them on for a bit and I'd sort of pretend that was me. And then I'd be like, oh, that's not me. And I don't really like those people anyway, mm. <laughs> like, you know? And then I'd sort of latch on to a different group of people and do what they were doing, you know, and then realize, like, yeah, I'm not into that thing either. Um, and but you, you, so that can be a really um, frustrating time for some people. Mm-hmm. It was for me. I found it frustrating. And then it took, it 
took probably a couple of years before I started to settle down into who I was Mm. type of people I like to hang out with and what I like doing yeah and you'll figure it out people figure it out you just have to follow follow the breadcrumbs then you get a loaf then you get a bakery yeah it's what most people it's what for most people their teenage years are about you know we when we're teenagers we go through all these different identify we're just figuring out who we are in the world most people who develop an eating disorder have to do that in the the time after recovery figure out who they are in the world without an eating disorder and it can feel frustrating because you feel like you're behind everybody else who already knows what they are and what they're doing what their career is and all that stuff just don't worry about it you'll catch up it was 30 when I started recovery I was 30 and I was like I had no savings didn't know what I wanted to do for a job I lost my passion for working with horses seven friggin' days a week riding nine horses mucking out 20 stables you know the role and I I was like who the fuck am I and why am I even here but then you start asking bigger questions and you get bigger answers and then you just have to just take one day at a time and figure out who you are exactly it's exactly right yeah okay I've got to choose one maybe two let's see which one this is maybe quite a quick answer would it be best to take time off work to focus on recovery I work as a teacher full-time so I get asked that quite a lot actually I think you know if you can if there's no reason why you can't do it and if you can afford to do it I don't see any reason why not however the majority of people is not really an option and even if it is an option it might put them in a little bit of a financial difficulty spot so I do believe that you can recover absolutely anywhere in any environment you just have to have that mindset of I'm eating without I'm eating Mm -hmm. unrestricted and it doesn't matter if I have to leave the class to go for a quick bathroom great break and shove a chocolate bar down my neck that's what I'm going to do and I'm going to make it work Mm -hmm. and you can make it work I believe in any environment you can do unrestricted eating if you're really like no I have a job that absolutely requires me to go hours and hours on end without eating then sure maybe you need to consider taking time off work but I think being a teacher, like most class periods are what, 45 to 60 minutes. Mm. And so then there's going to be a break. And a lot of the time, the reason that our brains don't like the idea of continuing to work whilst we're the eating the unrestricted is because we don't, we wouldn't get to make such a palaver of eating. You know, like if you've got a sort of three minute break between classes, you've just got to eat real fast yeah. and you've got to eat snacks and you've got to eat things without the sort of um without the ritual around eating whereas if you're at home you can do your silly little rituals and you can take a long time clean everything you just sort sort of brain prefers that I remember with me you know I was I can't remember what I was doing but I had to take snacks and I had to basically eat on the go while I was walking to the next thing this class or whatever I was doing and my brain absolutely hated that idea my brain was like no when you eat, you have to sit down and you have to be alone and you, you know, all these stupid things yes. that I had. And it was actually super, very beneficial for me to just be like, no, just shove it down your throat, like get on with it. And yeah. it actually was a really good thing for me to have to do. Yeah, I was so, it's, so ritualized about how I ate. So working, if it so actually could serve, serve you in recovery yeah. because you can't yeah. focus 100% on all the, right. you, the you, things. You know, you, yeah, exactly. You can't be ritualized about it. You can't be silly about it. You just got to eat it and get on with it. And yeah. often you have to eat snacky food that your brain doesn't like the idea of as much. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Okay, one quick one, and then it will lead into how I want you to share how people can work with you what and how got you into coaching and do you do you enjoy being a coach well I assume you do yeah <laughs> you I do, are one. I do. um I don't do it half as much as I used to I only do a couple of hours a day um um because I have a farm that's very yes. time consuming um I started writing about my recovery mostly for my own cathartic reasons and I started publishing blogs and honestly I don't think anybody was reading them and then one day I sort of looked on the WordPress statistics and I was like, oh shit, <laughs> people are actually reading this. And I was like, wow. And then like people would read it and then people would start to email me and ask me questions, which I'd kind of answer by email. And then people would ask if I could chat to them on the phone. And I did that. And then it just got to the point where I was like, okay, well, um, I can't sort of keep my full-time job and yeah. be talking to people as much. And so I quit my job and I did do, I did coaching full-time for a little while. 
Um, but then, you know, it, it wasn't ever something that I really wanted to do, obviously. Like I didn't wake up uh, as a kid and be like, I want to be an eating disorder mm-hmm. recovery coach. Um, I enjoyed doing it, but you know, it's something I think I'll always keep doing, but I also have to have other things in my life. Like my main coaching is not my main job. It's something I do very part time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my main job is something I'm super passionate about and wanted to do for all of my life from a kid, which is run a horse farm. So, yeah. so, you know, I, uh, yeah, like I'd say, um, I did it full time for a while and then I was just fine. Well, that's not leaving me enough time to do things that I feel like, you know, hmm. it's like the, when I recovered from my eating disorder and then it took me some time to really return back to being the person that I was before I had an eating disorder was just this crazy animal obsessed, horse obsessed person. And then, you know, I was doing coaching full time, but I really felt like I was suffocating that animal obsessed, horse obsessed person that really needed to come out. And so, you know, so I I do that full time now and just do some coaching. And I do really enjoy it. Yeah. And you're a legend in the eating disorder space. You can't deny that. (laughs) (laughs) I always say to people, you know, if people are interested in coaching, let's just say go for it. There's not like there's a capacity here, maximum capacity, because people want to talk to coaches coaches are supposed to be an expert by experience thing yeah and everybody's yeah. experience is different and not yeah. everybody will is experience will be able to identify with me and so or you and so there's always room for all these different life stories and all these different people that have got different experiences mm. there's not like there's capacity in this field I think the more coaches the better because then people be able to find somebody that they truly identify with me too I'm coaching a few people to be an eating disorder recovery coach not not because I'm a business coach but just because I'm sharing with them what I've done but they'll do it in their own way and they'll call their people in that yeah exactly exactly and yeah yeah yeah. and I always say look I look forward to the day when there is no need for eating disorder recovery coaches because that means that the main treatment model has come up to date enough that we're redundant fabulous that would be but wonderful in the right? meantime in the meantime there's a need for there's it. coaches mm-hmm. and I know you don't like to plug and all these things but I want to plug for you because people <laughs> need to come into your world you've recently started a paid YouTube channel right a subscription where you answer people's yes. questions yeah I do so um I I I've done a subscription model where like on the Monday I'm reading through this brick of a book that I wrote rehabilitate rewire recover so right. I'm reading through that like I read that on a live stream on a Monday slogging through it and then on a Friday or might be sometimes another day I'm not particularly organized but on a day another day I do live question and answer so people can send in their questions and then I'll ask, answer members yeah. questions on the live stream as well Awesome, um, and they can access that through your YouTube or website or both? No, I think it's just through the YouTube. Um, I think if you go to my YouTube channel, which obviously I forget what that is, it's probably just tab. If you type in your name, you come up immediately. Okay. It's because I've stalked you, I'm not sure, but it comes think, up for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at Tabitha Farrar. And so that's my YouTube channel. And then my, my website has got just blogs and um if people want to contact me they can contact me through my website that's got like a contact form or something like that email address yeah. and, and there's also YouTube. an old yeah. podcast you have that is on your website yeah. Still, right yeah that podcast yeah there's lots of episodes in there um I did I used to do lots of interviews with like mm. uh, industry experts and things like that and that's all the podcasts are actually I think it's on iTunes too I hope it is I but, think it um, is because I've listened on Spotify and iPhone uh, before I'm sure I have yeah yeah awesome well Tabitha thank you so much for coming on again I know you're a busy lady appreciate you so much yeah absolute pleasure thanks for doing it thank you so much and listeners let us know how you found the episode Tabitha's not um, active on Instagram much but tag me and I'll reshare you and appreciate you